Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure as always to introduce the King of Footscray, Braybrook's favourite son, it's Dougie Hawkins! How are you, Matty? How you doing, mate? Oh, absolutely fantastic, Dougie. Um, I'm pumped up because I've got uh, I've got a player here who uh, my dad used to speak about so fondly. And, um, you know, hopefully you've got uh, a few stories about him. And uh, it's none other than Merv Hobbs. I actually played my first year, Matty, at the Bulldogs with Merv. <laughs> No, that's not true. 1978. Yeah. So. I tell you what, Matty, um, and, and you know, all the Footscray people would know this and uh, a lot of footy people in general. Uh, he was so famous outside of his brilliant footy career and uh, a great player for the Bulldogs as a Rover type player. And that mark he took. Now, uh, Matty, uh, uh, I'm going to get this right because I, I know it. I picture it so clearly. I reckon it was a 1961 prelim final against Melbourne. Uh, he took it on a bloke called Trevor Johnson, who was the ruckman for Melbourne. He was about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and he was sideways. He was like this. Uh, you remember that, Mark Manning? Have you, have you seen the picture of it? I've seen the picture, yeah. It's, it looks incredible. So that's 61. So oh. I, I, I'm pretty sure, Matty, he, he would have played in our losing 61 grand final side, I would think, when Hawthorne beat us. I know quite well from that mark, he uh, created his own business called High Mark. Oh. It was a print, printing, printing business in uh, Williamstown, which I know of. Um, but Merv Hobb was a lovely bloke. I met him a few times over the journey and uh, a really good fella. Um, uh, certainly could play footy, certainly could play footy, but he's, he's so famous for that mark uh, that he took that in that prelim final. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I, I understand he was a rover. He had he kicked yeah. uh, one and a half, he averaged one and a half goals a game. So not unlike Brian Royal and um, and was also the leading goal kicker in, in 63 with Georgie Bissett and then also in 65. So, you know, he could, he could find the big sticks. When did he finish, Matty? When did, uh, when did he finish, uh, Hobbsy? Because I, I wonder if he would have went back to, or did he start at Williamstown or go back to Williamstown? When well, did he finish, Matty? You're going to be blown away with this, Dougie. So he started in 61. He ended in 65 at age 23. Did he yep. go? He didn't go to another club. I know that. No, so what was, happened? Was he was injured, he... Matty? Was he injured? Or what? Yeah, that's right. He did his knee in the preseason of 1966. And, you know, as, as you probably know, in those days, the, the, a total knee reconstruction, it was an anterior and an interior ligament. So he, so he just ripped it to shreds and, and, and ended up not being able to actually get back on the field for the next nine years at any level. At any level, fair thank you, Matty. Gee whiz, that's a... So, so Matty, how many games would Merv Hobbs play for the Bulldogs? What, 100 and something? 74. So, se 74. So, uh, again, uh, we're going back a long time. I was born in 60, so it makes it hard to... Yeah, you know, know all about this situation, but to hear you say that, um, seventy odd games. I, I thought he played a bit more than that because of his, because of the of the name Merv Hobbs. And I'll say it again, Matty. It was, it was that mark was just made it. Remember, you remember it clearly yourself. It was special, wasn't it? And he and he named his business High Mark, and he was a good bloke, Merv. Good fella. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, like being away from the game for nine years, he came back and played for, for Yarraville and then he, he made a real name for himself in country footy. He played for Melton, I understand, Brunswick. Uh, so, so he, you know, he was around the traps. He coached as well. So, you know, he's, he's a, a proper footy man. So he's a bit of a journeyman, Matty, after his career at the Bulldogs. And uh, uh, did you say he played at Melton, did he? Played at Melton and apparently there was a um, there was a final. It might have been a prelim final, and um, I believe he got thrown into into a fence. It might have been against some Sunbury or Ronzi or something like that. They pushed him into the fence and broke his jaw. And I'm, I, I believe we're going to ask him about this, but his brother apparently uh, jumped over the fence and um, and clocked the guy <laughs> who did it. So uh, yeah, there It was uh, it ended. It didn't end up well for Melton because they end up losing the grand final. Um, but uh, but I think that was a catalyst of a you know a, a big all in brawl. And obviously had the broken broken jaw from it. Right. <laughs> but anyway, Matty, um, a bulldog, famously known. Everybody knows Merv Hobbs. Uh, everyone has a story about Merv Hobbs. 
Um, just a fantastic, uh, fantastic play. And again, that high mark. It was, I don't remember seeing a mark as good as that um, from a rover. Horizontal. It was just amazing. Magnificent, Dougie. Well, I can hear him tapping on the door. He's probably jumping up right now. Let's You're on your hobsy. <laughs> on your hobsy. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the fantastic, amazing Merv Hobbs to Inside the Kennel. Welcome, Merv. Thank you very much, Matty. Thank you. Uh, look, we're absolutely delighted to have you on board today, Merv. And as we start with all our guests, we'd like to ask, how would you describe yourself as a player in your own words? Oh, uh, a, a small, uh, rather slowish rover but uh, had plenty of tricks and could kick both feet and could handball both sides and was very accurate goal kicking. Well, that's, that's very humble of you, Merv, and we're going to explore your career in great depth today. But I want to take you back to the very beginning. So you were born in, in, in 1942, if I'm correct, and, and you were just a drop punt away from, uh, from Witten Oval. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I was born in uh, Calvin Grove, a private hospital in Yarraville. And, and then I spent my childhood in 18 Beaumont Parade, West Footscray, in between the Wolf Doors and Sam's Coffee Bowl. And then when I turned nine years of age, uh, Dad was selling the home and we were going to move to Altona. And Footscray Footy Club got uh, wind of that and um, got me to sign with Bert Dunn, uh, Form 4, which had to be signed every year until I played with Footscray in the seniors. <laughs> But knowing what Footscray was always like at that stage, they'd forgotten about getting me to sign. So when we moved to Altona, I became uh, res res residentially tied to uh, South Melbourne. <laughs> so when, when we thought all was clear and I, I'd uh, played in practice games at Footscray in the seniors when I was 14, they, uh, South Melbourne said, well, um, you won't be playing with Footscray, son. You'll be playing with us at South Melbourne under... Um, Alan Miller was the coach, I think, then at that stage. And uh, I had to go over to South Melbourne and train when I was, uh, what was I, 16. I finished with the under-16s at Footscray, where I played for five years and uh, played 83 consecutive games with them. We were premiers four years out of the five years I was there. And I borrowed my big mate, Bobby, wears footy boots, and he wore size 12, so I could bucket these up. But... <laughs> But being probably a, a little bit uh, smart, I took a mark over Bob Skilton uh, kicking end to end and uh, Alan Miller raced down from the grandstand. I could see him and he said, you can stop buckerising around now, but you're not getting the clearance. Oh, oh no. So, yeah, so with that, and being at 16, that, you know, that kicked me in the bum. That I've always been a Footscray person. And um, uh, the dad said to me after we'd finished, um, what do you want to do? I said, it looks like I've got to play with South Melbourne. He said, well, I'll ring up uh, Alan Miller and speak to him about it and tell him that we're right. OK, we'll go in with you and we'll play with the thirds on Saturday. He rang Miller. Miller said he couldn't do that. It'd be unfair to the other players. Dad turned to me. He said, well, that's the message. What do you think? I said, we're not going to play with bloody South Melbourne. So we got in touch with Footscray Footy Club again uh, through Jack Collins and Jack Collins uh, sent us up to Daleson. I played for the next two and a half years at Daleson and was... Then I couldn't get a clearance to, to Footscray from Dale, so they wouldn't clear me. So, so the Ballarat League heard the first, uh, what would you call it, an appeal on clearance that they'd ever had. And uh, fortunately, I got cleared and then I went straight into the senior side two weeks later. That's what? about the start of my footy career there. Wow, wow. So what a journey then. So so from, from a person who was brought up in the western suburbs, ordained to play for the Dogs, you moved to Altona, you tell me. You're then somehow, um, you know, under the um, under the control of, the, of South Melbourne. And you put on size 12 boots to try and sneak out of it, but you couldn't help yourself and you jump on Bobby Skilton's back. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it was just a natural thing to do. You know, I, I taught myself how to mark by putting my brother over the side of a, a bed out in our back veranda when I was about eight and throwing the ball up in the air and, so there was a soft landing. I can mark the ball, land on the bed. And if I happen to miss the bed, Dad had a great uh, pack of nails, rusty nails on the back of the bed. And if I had a fall on over there, you probably would have been interviewing me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's where it started from. And Merv Lappy was a rover for Butch Gray. He was number 12. 
and he lived with us as a family when I was only a kid in Beaumont Parade. And I, I mum used to do his washing for the footy gear, and I used to hop on the Geelong Road bus when I was seven and eight and take his gear up to the Footscray Footy Club so that he could train in fresh gear for night time. And Dickie Wearmouth was a great friend of ours, and uh, my dad was a volunteer at the footy club for many, many years, and that's how, you know, we stuck all the time because we were Footscray. So am I right in saying that your dad had a role, as you say, um, as a doorman at, at, at Western Oval, as it was at the time, um, for functions and letting in people? How, so, so you had an in from the very early days um, at the club? Yep, yep. From right, right from the very start, I, I was given a football uh, in both my arms when I was two years of age, and uh, and I had that all along the line as a kid. And I went to Kingshall State School and was ca- finished up captain of the school side there with Keith Boomish, actually. And um, it, it was a great opener because we had no money. Dad was was a labourer, and and in the off season, uh, I'd wear boots to school by taking the socks out of the boots and putting chromite on it so I had flat, flat uh, feet and soles. And then when the footy season started, the chromite came off and socks were, were put into the, into the boots to make me play football with them. So that's, that's how it all came from. Wow, wow, that's incredible. So so from the age of two, um, and you've got a footy in your hand from the very beginning, I'm told that you're also invited down to the club to be act as a mascot in the early days. Well, I was, I was mascot with Keith, Keith and Barry Beamish, Keith's brother, and that was from about four years of age on, on till about eight years of age. And we, um, Keith used to sit on Charlie uh, Sutton's knee in the big committee room for the pre-game speeches, and I'd sit on Merv Lassie, Lassie's knee. And then we'd lead the sides out before the game, we'd lead the, and then we'd, we'd uh, go and in the quarter time huddle, we'd go over them and get half a piece of orange and then we'd race off the ground again and kick the footies around the boundary line. And then half time we'd go in with the players and then we'd lead them out again at half time and then three quarter time we'd get in the huddle and we'd be given oranges again. So it was all to do with Footscray and then we're in the rooms again after the after the game because my father was working there on the on the inside door. Wow. So what is it like as a little kid walking into the rooms and seeing these giants of footy and, you know, some of them, your idols, obviously, um, you know, was it was it just an awe-inspiring experience? Well, well that was, you know, through the Merv Laffey experience by living with him and, and having a kick of the footy out on the, uh, the, the street on the Bitumen Road. Um, it was interesting that um, when his foot made connection with the football, it sounded like a bloody bomb going off. And, <laughs> and I thought to myself, God, I'll never be able to kick a football like that. But that's where, you know, everything went when we were kids. We'd find a paddock, which was two or three doors up, and, and we were kicking a football, you know, every day and night. Yes. So foot, foot, football was what, what I lived for, nothing else. Yeah, it sounds very much like that. And and you touched on the fact that you went to Footscray um, in the under-16s. You mentioned yep. something you, you played, how many games? 78, did you say? Eight, 83 consecutive. 83. So how on earth does a player play in the under-16, 83 games? That sounds like four or five years of, of work. Well, I started when I was 10 and a half. The first game, John <laughs> Gillard and I played our first game together. John is a little bit older than me, but we played... Sunshine, uh, under 16, up at the H.C. Mac- McKay, Massey, Massey Harris, sorry, footy ground up North Sunshine. And that was every game for 83 games I'd ever missed a game. Wow. So as a 10-year-old, you're saying, you're basically yep. playing against 15 or 16-year-olds. Yep. They were, they were men to me, the boys were playing against the big fellas. Wow. So did it, was this really part of your sort of your journey? Did, were you able to sort of become the player you, you became ultimately because you played, you know, with, with, with these giants or bigger kids? Well, I think it was because I played footy nearly, you know, from about uh, eight years of age, I played competitive football because I was Kingsville, Kingsville Footy Club captain. I played, I was 19th man when I was in the third grade at Kingsville State School, so I was about seven. And uh, as I say, Keith Beamish was there as well, Barry Beamish. So, yeah, football was all that I ever wanted to do, mate. Well, that sounds like an incredible story. So, so here you are. You're um, you've you've avoided playing for the uh, the dreaded South Melbourne Swans. You've you've cruised out to the country to play for Dalesford, and yep. you're struggling to get a clearance. But you've you've told us in 1960 you were granted a permit to play for the Footscray Reserves Round One at, at Western Oval. This is your big opportunity, I guess. How did how did you go? 
yeah, what went well. Uh, the, the, the bloke called uh, Peter Kurt, Curtis, he, he came from back to Mars. He played as well. We were, the, we were the two Rovers. He broke his leg and we kicked five. Before he broke his leg, we kicked five goals between us. So that that was a, that was a good one. It was a win for us. But uh, then I had to go back to Dalesford. And then the next year, the same thing happened where I got a permit to play uh, in the reserves again. And I was only what's just turned 17 then. And uh, both, would you believe, both the sites that I played against in those two permit games were both still on. Yeah. So, and, and then, of course, the, I, I missed, I played the first three games with Dalesford in 1961. Well, we, we went premiers. Dalesford played in the premiership in 1960. I was voted best on the ground in a losing side. And then 1961, I played the first three games. And that's when Footscray said, well, just sit it out now because we're going to have to go from the field to get a clearance for it. And I, I'd kicked nine goals in that last game. So I think that was the, that was the clincher. I think Footscray said, well, we might have something here. So. Well, I actually, you're being even more modest here because I went through the archives down at Footscray Library and I saw that you you were you polled three votes in the first three games, plus you kicked 20 goals in the first three games. So you were not only the leading goal kicker in the league, but also the leading vote getter in the league after three rounds. So no wonder the dogs were coming after you. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's right, uh, Matty. And, and in 1961, the end of that year, I missed the first eight games at Footscray because of that clearance wrangle and so on. And I finished up um, being told that I was recruited of the year, even though I'd only played 10 games, 10 home and away games in that year, because I'd had two best on ground, a Brownlow medal vote, medal vote. So I had more, more votes than any other first year player. I'd, I'd missed the first eight games. So wow. I very happy. The year later, Matty, George Bissett won, won the best first year player, and he got all, all white goods. I didn't even get a handshake. But you know what? It's in the record books, and we're we're printing this, Merv. So, uh, so we can celebrate you in it in a small way today. Good on, thanks, mate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So here we are, round eight. You've uh, you've you've turned up to the dogs. You waited for your clearance for a, a good five weeks or so. Can you t- yeah. tell us how it was that you came down to the to the kennel? Um, what was it like walking through the doors and seeing some of those players and knowing now, actually, I'm a bulldog like you. Well, well, it wasn't much different to what I'd known all of my, all of my junior life because I'd, I'd played those six years, you know, with the under-16. And, and and there were eight players in that senior side that I walked down to, you know, walked in the rooms to play with, like the two Ian brothers and Bobby Ware and Bobby Spargo and uh, there's a couple I'll miss out on, I suppose, and Johnny Gillard. There were eight players out of the under-16 side who had made it to the seniors at Footscray. And when I walked in, I knew half the players anyway. So that was that was great. I, I loved the club and I loved what they did in 1954. I, I knew all of the players because that association with my dad, and it was it was as if I was move, you know moving back home. Wow, wow. So tell us what it was like. There was there's obviously some really big figures at the time, and we, you know we're talking about Charlie and uh, Gentleman John, and obviously the great EJ. What was it like being in their company? And, um, you know, what, what are your recollections of them in the early days? Well, Charlie was a great bloke on and off the field. And, and, and as we, we got to know him a lot better for away from footy when my dad had a Dahlia farm, and that's why we moved to Altona. And Charlie Sutton used to, with his tip truck, he used to, he used to deliver the soil to us. So, and that was through the butch break connection, and that dad got that. And, uh, you know, I... I just love being around him. And John Schultz, well, he's, he's the greatest man that I've, I've ever known. And John has never changed at all in his attitude to anything. And, you know, he's had a bit of heart, heartache in his uh, in his life. And I just love the man. And, um, to, to, uh, John, John had a bit of a problem. And he went to my dad one day. He said, Bluey, because that was dad's income. He said, why do I keep dropping a lot of high marks over head marks? And Dad, my dad said to him, he said, do you really want me to tell you? He said, yes. He said, well, you seem to be closing your eyes on impact with the ball. And he said, oh. And, and that's like, there's a brand line medalist has gone to an old bloke who's on the bloody gate. So it was it was uh, tricky for, for a person like him to do that. And actually, Whitten came to me one night. He was having trouble kicking accurately for goal when he was playing in the ruck. And we had to teach, reteach him how to kick torpedo. So there's an old bloke. <laughs> being taught by a young boy. So here you are, the boy from Dalesford um, gets a tap on the shoulder. It's round eight and uh, it's time to make your debut. Um, can you walk us through that amazing day? 
<laughs> well, I, I'd have I'd have nerves and everything when we're living outside and, and, and waiting for Dad to get ready so that we'd jump jump in the car because I didn't have a, a license at that stage. Jump in the car and go up to the ground and and of course then once you get to the, the ground and you know a lot of people as well as far as spectators because they were the parents of the other blokes that were there that I played footy with an under sixteen. And they'd be well wishes and patting you on the back and you're thinking to yourself, where do I go next? You know, where do I go to get my socks or do I bring my own boots? And <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of lot of things. Once you got out on the ground, it was a lot different. But I've always thought you've got to take a bit of a knock or a bump to know that you're in a in a match, whether it be the, your first one or, or, or your hundredth game, I think. It just it, it just wills you back into your, your, your senses come good then. I bet it did, and uh, you know there wasn't much of you. You were sixty-seven kilos, I'm told. So, how was it playing against you know seasoned men? Well, at that stage, there was a, a bit of a competition with World of Sport to find out who was the lightest bloke playing VFL football, and there was me, Joey Faulkner, and uh, Bruce McMaster Smith. Bruce McMaster Smith was from Fitzroy, and uh, Joey Faulkner was from Geelong to Carlton, and I finished up being the lightest bloke when I was nine stone three. So what a season um, to arrive at the club, 1961. Obviously, we'd made the, the grand final and won the premiership in 54, but it was a, you know, it was an unfulfilling period. Um, we didn't make the big dance again until your arrival. And um, here we are in 1961, at uh, the start of September. We're back in the finals race, back in the top four. What was the, what was the feeling like around Footscray and, and, uh, and the emotion? Can you recall that? I know it's a long time ago. Yeah, well, if we go back to the last home and away game, we had to beat Geelong at home to make the four. It was only four then, like a couple of years later, 10 years later, it was a five and all that, but it was a four, and, and the ground was a quagmire. And uh, we finished up, we, we beat Geelong, that got us into the four. So we've basically had a finals, a semi final game against Geelong in the last home and away game of the year. We've played uh, the, what, the first semi final. Then the preliminary final, and we had to front up to the grand final. Yeah, absolutely. So before you made it to the to the grand final, there were two really important matches uh, along the way. So you obviously had the semi final against the Saints, and then um, the famous preliminary final against the Demons, uh, where you um, became immortalised in a way with um, with one of the most amazing feats um, of high marking that we've that we've seen. Can you can you um, talk us through some of those memories, and particularly um, you know that great mark? Well, the, the memories were that. Uh... <laughs> Witten, Witten had uh, um, uh, Brendan Edwards in, in his sights for the, before the match started because we thought he'd be the match winner for them in the centre and, and, and Ted tried to, tried to hit him hip and shoulders and he finished up getting a cork leg out of it and, and that, that actually restricted him for the grand final. But the, uh, the win against um, St Kilda the first time was exhilarating. You know, Nobody expected us to get any further than probably that first semi-final and then we went to play Melbourne, that one you're talking about with the leap of, leap of the mark, uh, that stopped Melbourne's run of five consecutive premierships wow. by beating them. And and I think that was those three games to a heavy toll on us. It was really little light young blokes. And, of course, as I said before, the, the, in the grand final, it was, uh, it was very hot, hot and steamy. But, and, and Hawthorne just steamrolled us. But uh, the Melbourne one, we just we played on instinct, I think, and we had, you know, quick blokes on the wing. That Alec Gardner, who was probably one of the fastest players I ever saw play the game, a long, striding little man. And then you had Ted, who played ruck Raven, and you had John Schultz, who was absolutely brilliant as a, as a ruckman and as fast as I've ever seen a ruckman could run. And Bobby Ware and Charlie Evans were in the back line. We fell heaps of attacks by Melbourne. And, yeah, it was a, was a great win. And that was basically, I think, if we have an afterthought, that was our grand final. You talk about um, that that amazing mark as well. I believe it was Trevor Johnson um, yeah. who uh, you used as a step ladder. You would obviously practice that with your brother many years earlier. Clearly paid off on that day. That's correct, but I, but I didn't use him as step ladder. I didn't touch him until I was coming down. <laughs> well, if you look at the mark, my legs are up, my heels are up behind my head, and uh, if I touched. It, I think I brushed his shoulder on the way down, and. Um, I think Trevor Johnson remarked a few years later, he said, oh, there's some little unknown bloody bloke happened to take the mark of the bloody century over me. He said, I've played 214 games, played in six premiership or something, and he'd done nothing, but he's taken that mark. 
Yeah, well, what what an incredible uh, mark it was. And did that change your life in any way? It, you know, whenever your uh, your name's mentioned, that that picture and image is flashed all around the screen and it really is an iconic one for our club. Yes, it, it, it did. And, I, and, and a cousin of mine who was a commercial artist, he did all the artwork for mine. We started off a printing game when we were, when we were 20 years of age, a printing press. And we named it I Mark Press, and he, he believed that was a way to publicise yourself. And, and it did. It worked out terrifically well. And I had that printing business for 28 years and sold it to my partner for a while. But, um, yeah, look, every, everywhere you go, if somebody recognises your name, they'll say, oh, yeah, the Mark. Here's a photo of the Mark. So it's gone all over the world. So, yeah, yeah, I'm thankful for it, but I'm not thankful for busting me leave when I was 23, but however... Right, we, we'll get to that, Merv. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, so the disappointment of the 1961 um, Grand Final. You know, we led at half time. The heat yeah. took over. You know, we, you've spoken about three basically elimination finals in a row, and it just overwhelmed. Well, the Grand Final was as hot as Hades, and there were there were ten of us in the first aid room at half time because Hawthorne had belted Christ out of us. And um, that, that's what slowed us all down. We were 10 points in front of, at half time, but the, the atmosphere, as, as what you asked originally, the atmosphere was terrific. Nearly 108,000 people there because there was standing room then. And uh, we we're all given a football to go out and kick it into the grants, into the stands or into the crowd. And I was trying to pick out my brother and I couldn't find him, so I just had to give it out to the fence to somebody else. But, you know, it was, it was a wonderful feeling. But... But the, uh, the 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 feeling of defeat was, was terrible. Right. It was terrible. You know, you, you've got to shake hands with the opposition, and and they're, they're jumping around and as happy as Larry, and we've lost, and we're, we're injured, and we feel bloody awful for letting the supporters down. But it was something that's you know it stays in your mind for the rest of your life. And there are a lot of other players that have gone by the wayside who've never played in the grand final. So yeah, that was that was, that was good. But 1962 came along. It was a year of great hope again. And um, you started the, the, that season like a house on fire. I understand one of the early matches against the Swans, you had a day out, a career high, um, and you slammed through a few sausage rolls on that day. Can you tell us about uh, about that? Yeah, well, that was a nice payback. That It was eight, eight goals I kicked on that day. And um, the previous couple of games before that, the opening of, the, of that season, we, we beat uh, Hawthorne, who went premiers in 61. We beat them in the return match at Footscray that year. A lot of people didn't realise that. Mm. But um, the reason I reckon we went downhill in 62 uh, was because a lot of the players left. You know, Bobby Spargo and a couple of other blokes who were good players and, and, and good part of our backbone of the footy club, they left Graham Ian and they went to other clubs and, and we just didn't have the replacements for them. So let's let's investigate sixty two a little bit more. Um, you personally, your meteoric rise uh, resulted in you after twenty games of league footy being represented, uh, being selected to play for Victoria for the Big V. Can you tell us about that honour and some of the people or players you played uh, with and against? Yeah, well, it was on my twentieth birthday, as it, as it turns out. Wow! And 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 the only time I've ever been replaced during a game. Was that was that game at half time? I don't think I had a touch for the, the first half. It rained all bloody day. Um, it was a terrible game. But it was a terrible game, but a terrible day. And Ian Stewart, uh, who, who won those couple of three brownlows, he, that was his first initial uh, interstate game, and he was he was terrific. You could tell he was going to be a player of, of substance. But players in that side for, for, for uh, Victoria were Ian Bluey, Shelton, and uh, Tom Tur Turkey, Tom Carroll, and uh, Jack Clark, and uh, actually, I think Jack Clark was the reason why I didn't get any bloody kicks because he never came off the ball. He was first rover, and that's where he stayed, and I stayed in the forward pocket. When I went to shake hands with the guy, uh, John Bingley, uh, he grabbed all of my hand and tried to toss me over the fence. <laughs> he, would, he wouldn't let go. He tried to throw me over either the fence. But, uh, yeah. but after, after the game, uh, uh, Bluey Shelton was awarded best on the ground. I think it was 20 poundy he got for being best on the ground. And when it was mentioned it was my birthday, the first thing he did was at the hotel we were at, pull all the tables together, here's the 20 pound and that's all for Hobbs' birthday. And I thought that was a wonderful, wonderful gesture. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I imagine you had the big V jumper on and, you know, despite it being a dirty day, it turned well and, um, you know, you, no one can take that away from you. 
No, they can't, mate. No, it's lovely. It's great. great. I had to come home to, to that 20th birthday party at, at home, actually, after all that. <laughs> brilliant, yeah, brilliant. John Schultz work, yeah. Love it. Love it, Merv. And later on, um, I believe it was 1963, you um, you also became the vice vice captain of the club um, and you supported John Gillard. Was, you know, what an honour that must have been to, um, you know, to, to be recognised as a leader. Well, that was just for the one game, mate, Matt, because Witten and Schultz were away playing interstate football. And, and uh, uh, you know, many years before, as I was saying originally, that in the under-16, John Gillard was was captain for three years at the under-16, and I was his vice-captain for three years. So it was, uh, you know, just to come up again in your first official uh, appointment as vice-captain, and I was vice-captain to John Gillard, was who was captain. So uh, history repeating itself. Yeah, yeah, but it was lovely. It was nice, and it was a good recognition for, I suppose, for effort or whatever. Yes, absolutely. And and look, for for a little fella, you obviously could find the goals. You talked about that eight goal performance, but you were also um, uh, the leading goal kicker twice. You you equaled with uh, with Georgie Bissett in sixty three, and then you were the outright outright winner in in sixty five. Why were you such a you know a dead eye dick in front of the goals? Well, it's the way my father taught me. We used to go each Sunday when we lived at Altona down to the Al- Altona footy ground and, and half a dozen other kids would join in and, and, and my dad was teaching me how to kick torpedo and that's all I would kick for goal. I don't think I ever kicked a drop kick for goal. I mean, nobody kicks, you know, they kick a bloody drop kick anyway nowadays, but uh, it was all torpedoes and if, if you happen to uh, miss with the, the spiral of a torpedo, you could always get a flat punt out of it and, and there's a chance that it'd go straight. Have you got a favourite goal? If, is there one that sticks out in your mind as being the best goal you ever kicked? Uh, probably one at Longwood, up the bush. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think. I know, I know the one that I missed was the worst one I've ever missed. It was up at the cow shed end and, uh, you know, Barclay Street end and I, I raced around the front of the pack. The ball dropped down in my, into my waist and chest I flicked it with my left foot and pulled the bloody thing back too far, and a goal would have won the game for us. We lost by five points. Oh no, they're the ones that stay with you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, the worst ones stay with you. I reckon the best ones that you've got to try and recollect. But there, there would have been snapshots uh, for goals um, in, in different matches. Probably there's a couple now that you now that you mentioned that, Matty. When we played Collingwood at Collingwood, they just had the outer done with uh, blue stone bloody rocks stones. And in the first quarter, I took a mark very deep in the pocket and, and I kicked an angle goal. And, of course, uh, the, the Collingwood supporters went bloody mad and Footscray supporters reckon it was terrific. But then I got a handful of yonings tossed on the back of my head. They'd thrown bluestone metal over and they whacked me on the, on the back and on the head for kicking the goal. So I took another mark about, it. I don't know, 10 minutes, quarter of an hour later. As soon as I kicked the ball, kicked the goal, I ran like buggery to get away from it all because they were still throwing rocks. Wow. I think, it was, we think it was the same mob of old women who would wait out the, the back of the uh, grandstand with the changing rooms where ready to each over the head with an umbrella if you beat Collingwood. <laughs> and that's true. That's the truth. That happened. Well, in some ways, very little changes as history goes on because I've, I've been down to Vic Park or even at some Collingwood games and you get out of there if things aren't going well. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. You get out with your life, you've done well, I reckon. Yeah, fantastic. Now you you talked about obviously the um you know the the lack of success or you know the the sadness of losing the sixty one grand final, but you you did taste some premiership success. I understand um in the preseason or the night matches um in nineteen sixty three and also sixty five, I believe you were you were crowned the night premiers. Um, yeah. So I, I heard that the nineteen sixty five one uh, ended a little bit prematurely for you, despite the the win. About ten minutes ago, I think it was, Matty. You've, you've, you've done. You've looked up your history. Uh, yeah, I was running through the seat. We were about five goals up with like no ten minutes to go, and I'd handballed the ball over the top of Alan Morrow in the centre of the ground. And Alan Morrow said, "Well, bugger this!" And he kept going, and he hit me with his forearm. And I went to uh, the Prince Alfred Hospital by ambulance, and I had a suspected fractured skull. I had a fractured jaw, knocked out teeth, and a broken nose. Um, and then. Uh, it looked like I was going to have to have a blood transfusion. Ooh. Charlie Evans jumped in the, in the ambulance and came to the hospital with me, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I had, uh, I think it was 10 stitches up from the nose down into the mouth. And uh, about three, a uh, fortnight later, I had a, um, 
uh, a bit of a bit problem. I'd spewed up that amount of blood. That's when they thought I'd have to go in and have a blood transfusion. But um, yeah, yeah, that was that was that was that. That was a bit dicey. But it, I, I did get right. Apart from being best on the ground, I was given the best player for for that. I won a reefer jacket. I think it was that night. But yeah. Wow, wow. Well, did you get to to have a um, a premiership beverage with uh, with any of the players, uh, despite being no, in the hospital? No, no, I nearly died. I, I had to go back after I was let out from the Prince Albert Hospital for five or six days. Um, actually, before I was let out of there, Ted Whitten turned up one day, and he had a can of beer in it in his pocket inside his bloody jacket. And he walked in, he's looking a bit sheepish. He said, how are you going? And I've got this bloody cook nose. And I said, oh, not too, not too good, Ted. I said, what do you, he said, how about having a beer with me? I said, having a beer with him? I can hardly <laughs> bloody talk. He's pulled this bloody can of beer out. He's got a straw in and shoved it in my mouth. Well, I really wasn't a drinker then. I've made up for it since, but I wasn't a drinker then. And it nearly broke the stitches in his bloody mouth because I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> and the nurse, the nurse came along and said, Ted, you're not doing the right thing there. Leave him alone, please. Yeah, yeah. But after that, I'd had a relapse. But once I was sent back home, I had to go to Butch Bay Hospital for about a fortnight, and that's when the blood transfusion was spoken about. But, uh, yeah, I was was pretty touch and go for a while. Then. Wow, wow. Um, so what an incredible thing. And, um, and you, look, you just mentioned a little bit about Teddy Whitten and some of the shenanigans that, that went on. I'm sure you've got a story or two there. Is there anything in, in the vault that you've got about Teddy or, you know, the likes of Georgie Bissett or any of those characters back in the day that you could share with us? Yeah, I've got a couple about Whitten, actually. We played in a practice game and we're at Footscray and we're going to uh, Point Lonsdale Life Saving Club to have a bonding, bonding weekend. And... Barry Beatty, who played a few games with Footscray and became CEO at Footscray at one stage, he and I, and I think it was Murray Susan, and a young fella called Frank Fanning, it was to be his first year. Uh, we were all ready to hop in my car at the back, and Whitney's run, run out to the back of the grandstand, and he said, hey, you blokes are going to be having a beer, aren't you? He said, no, we're not going to have a bloody beer. He said, yes, you are. He said, get me a cart and a beer, will you? So and he's given us 20 or 40 quid or something. So I thought, oh, well, this is all right. We can have a beer. So I called into a pub in Geelong, and I knew that my uncle worked beyond the bar, so we had about three beers there. And we drove down to uh, Port Lauderdale, and I'd missed the turn to the uh, life-saving club. So I said, I'll do a Yui just around the back of the um, the mountain, sandy mountain, so you can do a U-turn, and the car will slide around in the sand. Well, it didn't slide around the sand. It went straight down to the bloody a axles. <laughs> and we had to, the sort of four of us had to walk all the way back to the uh, Point Lionswell Surf Life and Club, Saving Club and tell them that the car was blocked and you'd come and give us a hand. Well, Whitten was halfway through a speech and he said, where have you bastards been? I suppose you've been out in the bloody grog, have you? Yeah, and, and, I'm, and I, I'm, I'm ready to say, but you gave us some money to go and get it for you. Stitch up. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and yeah, and the other thing you've done, you've taken a first-year recruit down there and, and, and you've been to a pub as well. <laughs> oh, so any, anyway, I, I wasn't game enough to say to him, you sent us down there, you old bugger. But um, th that same weekend, uh, David Thorpe was playing with Footscray and Ian Whitten had, had a bit of a blue and Thorpe said, well, I'm going home. So he jumped in his car, Whitten jumped in his own car. And when we was trying to catch him, he's run up this uh, island, concrete island, in the middle of the road, and he ripped the guts out the bottom of his car. So that was enough. That pretty good bonding this trip was. Yeah. <laughs> what a yeah. trip! Yeah. So there were there, there were some good, they, but they were they turned out to be you know that nobody got injured. That it was, it was good bonding in the end. But some stories that we could keep in our mind about what Whitten did. Unbelievable! I love that. Um, what about Georgie Bissett? We had him on recently, and we can see he's he's one cheeky chap. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to to hear a tale about him. Right, we were playing Fitzroy out at Fitzroy, the old Fitzroy Oval, one day, and this bloke he was nudging me, pushing me, and you know trying to put me off my game. And Georgie could see what was going on, and he's run up behind him, jumped jumped on him on his back, wrapped his arms around his throat. He said, hit the bastard now. I'm hit the bastard now. And I couldn't <laughs> stop laughing because it looked like a little monkey on the back, on the back <laughs> of a boat. So that, that was another little instance. But with Georgie, he and Ivan, the master were real good mates. And we went to play a game up at Tokenwall. 
and we stayed at one of the Tokemore pubs. It might have been the one that Donnie Whitten had, I think. And um, somebody said to me, come out here, come outside, come out in the backyard here. And there was a bloke there trying, trying to make, a trainer trying to make this cow get wild so he could hop on, on top of it and get it to buck jump. And he was grabbing it by the tail and wishing it around the backyard. And we hear this little voice, hey, have you got me more left there? And the voice came back, Georgie, you've just drank the last three. <laughs> so we dropped the empty cans down. Of course, all, all the committeemen came out then, and I think they just had a laugh. I didn't do too much about it. But, but, but Georgie was a good little fella, good little fella. Yeah. I have him for many years, uh, Matty, absolutely. But you, we, we, we're a good combination, as, as, as uh, he and I and um, Keith Beamish were too. But they were good days. Yeah, and, and am, I, am I right in saying that you you guys used to change on ball and in the forward pocket and there was a, a game with where Teddy Whitten was struggling a little bit at centre-half forward and employed you in a, in a certain way to uh, to get an advantage? Yes, yes. Teddy was playing centre-half forward on Freddie Swift and he's raced over to me and they, oh, I had a nickname called Ferret and he said, Ferret, this bastard has given me a bar. He said, you come over here and, and, and change Rover with with Bissett that sent half forward. Well, it worked. We got a couple of kicks and marks. We didn't kick three goals, I think, in that next quarter. So, it, it, yeah, it came off and we, we won the game. And that was out at another oval that's not used anymore, Punt Road. So we had Fitzroy, the old Fitzroy oval. We had the Punt Road oval. Yeah, good, good days. But but Whitten was a big enough man to admit to things like that. Right. You know, when he try something different, you know, that was good. Yeah, well, what a great tactic. that That's paid off. And... Um, so 1965, you're third best and fairest. You're flying. You're 23 years old. You're about to head into your, probably, you know, your peak. And yeah. um, here we are at the start of 1966, pre-season training. You run out there and suddenly something happens and, and, and your life turns, you know, pretty much 180. Can you tell us um, about that day? Yeah, it was one of those. It was a, it was a serious injury, but it was a simple way that it happened. Uh, on the grandstand side, the EJ Witten grandstand side, uh, both Alan Mannix and I and, and, and whoever else was there were running towards the fence to get the ball towards the boundary line. And because Alan and I uh, were mates off the field, I gave him a little bit of a shove. He was in front of him. And my right leg went in between his legs. And as he, he was running, his legs crossed each other. And, of course, my leg was in the middle of it. And that's what started the damage with my knee. And then I went down on the ground and the trainers raced out to me. And they said, oh, well, look, see how you go for a while. And bugger me, did if the ball didn't come up straight away. And I raced after the ball. And a bloke called Bob Parsons grabbed hold of me, slung me, and the leg went again. But anyway, they took me off the ground then. And then, and then on the training night on the Thursday, they said, look, go out and train. You can't do any more damage. So I thought, oh, shit, I don't they know what they're talking about. So I go out there and I uh, have a snapshot for goal and bang, snap. Whoa. But, yeah, that's the way it was. Ron McGowan was sitting up in the grandstand. He wasn't training this night, and he, he raced down from the grandstand, grabbed hold of my hand, and he told me all this later. And he said, I thought you'd broken your bloody hand. He said, you gripped it that hard. And uh, that's that's where I'd, um, you know, done the cartilage and the ligaments in the big side of the knee. But the worst part is when we got into the club rooms, we were into the first aid room, and there was Dr. D'Ambra, Dr. Louis D'Ambra, a trivic like trivic doctor. Me and Jack Collins were talking. And uh, Jack and I have said to him, well, what, what do you think the result's going to be? He said, well, he won't, well, Dr. Louis and Bianca answered him and said, well, he won't play sport again. Well, that ended, ended me. I was just in tears and I went went home with uh, my printing card and took me home to my place and, you know, I just broke down. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. So, wow. Yes, yeah, that was the end of it for so many footy. Wow, wow. Because these are the days that, you know, a total knee reconstruction is, um, you know, almost impossible to come back from. And, how does it? How does a twenty-three-year-old handle that? We, we, you know, we look at like a, a Bailey Smith now. He's out for twelve months. He'll come back. But you know, you, you're an elite athlete at the top of your game. How did you mentally handle that? Well, I, I think it's because a partner, a printing partner, and I had just started off our printing business, and, and that kept us busy. And I think that kept us. Away. And the funny thing was that the Monday that weekend that I played footy and, and did my knee. He played footy with Yarrow and did his shoulder. So we've come into our printing business and he's got his arm in a bloody sling and I'm on, on crutches. So that was a pretty good start for our business. But uh, I think it was because we did have that business as, as um, taking away uh, 
of if you were in, say, an ordinary job and you're working for somebody else, you'd feel a bit sorry for yourself. But because you're working for yourself, you still had to get up and perform. Otherwise, you didn't have any, any money. Sure, I understand. Um, so, so here it is. We fast forward nine years, um, and um, and you know you've you've played no competitive sport, I guess, and um, and and finally you're able to somehow pull the, the boots back on, Merv. I understand, and 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 play again for the the VFA. Um, how was that? How were you able to get yourself back in a physical condition to play again? Well, when I played, I played uh, one game for Yarraville and, and, and couldn't see the game out. I was I had to go off with my knee. Then I got a clearance many years ago to uh, to go to Williamstown, and Bobby, Ware, who was my best mate, still is my best mate, and he's not very well at the moment. Um, he was captain of Williamstown, and I was playing for Yarraville. Actually, I played for Yarraville at that stage, and I went down on the ground with my knee. He came over, grabbed me by the hand, and asked me how I was going, and lifted me up. And he said, "I got the he got the greatest roast he's ever had in his life from Jerry Callahan, his coach." He said. Leave the little bastard down on the ground. He might be your best mate, but you're playing against him, not with him. <laughs> so, yeah, but William Street, well, William Stout, well, I don't know where you want to go with the William Stout thing. I coached them for three years and then I was president for another three years and saved them from from ruin. They uh, they were in trouble. I gave it away for a couple of years and they appointed another president and um, he put them into debt a certain amount of money and we had to raise heaps of money. We raised 90000 I think it was, in six weeks, and that saved the club from extension. But, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. So what a storied career. So, so you know, you've, you've headed out to the country. You've played, obviously, for, for, for Yarraville. You've played for Brunswick. Did you play yeah. for um, for Melton as well? Did I hear that you were involved yeah. in a really um, incredible final series where it got pretty telling? <laughs> yeah, I got pushed into the fence headlong by... Um, Paul Fanning, who's Fred Fanning's son who played for Melbourne, and uh, cracked me jaw on the top rail of the bloody uh, metal fence. And, uh, you know, all of our good players before then were weak players after that, and they, they just stayed over around us. It was terrible. Wow, wow. And did, well, am I right in saying that your brother, the brother that you used to jump off the back to, to learn how to, t- to take a mark, jumped in and, and supported you on that day? Yeah, he, he, jumped, he jumped up off the... Off the bench, he was there as a spectator, but only because of my brother. We were sitting inside the ground, and he stepped up and whacked Fanning in the jaw. That's when he came near him, some other time it was later on in the game, whacked him in the jaw. Yeah, that that brother of mine who's passed away, he was Australian buck jump champion many years later. <laughs> he was a tough little bugger. He was a tough little bugger. Well, well, it clearly runs in the family, Merv. That's for sure. Um, so, looking at all these, you know, the, obviously, you know, your your league career ended, but um, you've gone off and you've done all these wild and wonderful things. Um, do you look back at um, and what happened in your story as being unfulfilled, or was this part of your journey that you look back proudly on? Um, well, a lot of it was um, uh, coincidences. You know, I, I coached the under nine and Footscray for three years, and, and I've still got blokes that I coach there, I call them the kids I coach them, they're nearly as old as me because they're, they, they're turning 75 now and I'm nearly turning 82 wow. and I still refer them as the young blokes I used to coach. Yes. And then, of course, you had Melton and the, the Brunswick. I didn't coach at Brunswick. We had Yarraville and Williamstown. And, uh, and Long, Longwood was up near Yarrowa and that was one of the best places. I, I broke my bloody leg up there in playing for Longwood at Yarrowa that... Uh, I still have friends who make contact with me from all those clubs. And I, I don't think I'd have had those types of friends if I'd have stayed with my career uh, right through the uh, league as long as I, I may have, you know. Amazing, amazing. And um, so looking back at, um, at the players that you uh, you played for with and against, are there any, um, are there any, let's start with your opponents. Were there any opponents that stood out as being, you know, incredible and, um, and maybe maybe a little bit dirty or ones that you love to hate as well? Well, Bobby Stilton was a, was a was a great and a fair player. Yes, and I had, I had an association with him later on on one of the honeymoons. But um, he was an excellent player because he was so good on both sides of his body too. Uh, but but a bloke I played I didn't play on, but played against Darrell Baldock. He could do anything. Like he was yeah, he was left and right hand and left side and right side, and 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 a good bloke off the field, a real good bloke. He got me drunk one day in the 62 grand final at Footscray when Freemish and Clip on in 62 in the reserves. Love that. Love it. 
And um, what about your teammates? Who were the who were the standouts? Obviously, you know, I've got some in my mind who I imagine you're going to say. But who were the who were the greatest players you played with? Oh, Charlie Evans, uh, John Schultz, um, and you had Alec Gardner, Georgie Bissett. BT Beamish was a good player. He wasn't there for a long time, but he was shifted down to Gippsland and, and was town clerk, so he had a real good job. Um, Barry Smith, um, then, then more so in the 54 sides and in the 50, 50 era, we had Don, you know, Don Ross and Peter Box and uh, Harvey Stevens. And Harvey Stevens was one of the nicest men I've ever met in my life, and he looked a big tough bucket, but he was a big lovely man. And you had Bernie Lee and you know, your Char- Charlie Sutton, Wally Donald, Alan Martin. Um, these are all of the 1950 year, and they were terrific. And of course, I just idolised them because I was a kid. Yes. And, and and I could go in the rooms and see them, and they talked to me. And even later on in life, uh, uh, I was uh, I knew the plot of those players, you know, and, and uh, name by name. And we were walking down the street, and they'd know me as me, but I know them as Alan Martin or whatever. So yeah, that was wonderful, and I. You know, I'll never forget that era, you know, from when I was born up until when, when I started to play with the screen in 61. It was terrific. Well, what a candy store of, um, of Bulldog greats you've just named there. And and one person that, you know, you, you've spoken about right throughout this podcast episode today was the great EJ. We, we often hear, um, you know, supporters speculating on, on, you know, Ted Whitten and comparing him to, you know, the, the likes of Marcus Bontempelli today. Can you tell us what it was like to play alongside the great EJ? Well, you knew he always had to, he always had your back. He, he was he was um, he was a protector as far as using his arms. He was great at throwing his arms out and shepherding. He'd usually cop about four blokes around the, around the throat on the way through. But but he gave you a lot of confidence because he would bring you into a game. He would never leave you out of a game if you. If you were on the outside of a pack somewhere and he could win the ball, he'd, he'd yell out to you, here it comes, or get ready for this one, Hobbsy, or whatever. And, and, and he was great. But if we're talking about good players, Jack, I, I think Jack Collins was probably the best the best footballer I've ever seen in that era. Wow. But, but, but he didn't have the temperament that Ted Whitten had. Right. D- different temperament. But, but Jack Collins played and represented Victoria right down the centre of the ground from full back to full forward. I've no, I don't know of any other player that's ever done that. You know, that's that's full back, centre back, centre, centre forward, and full forward. I don't know of any other player. Whitten didn't do that, but I think he was he was he probably had the most ability that I've seen. Thank you so much, Merv. Um, now you transition then um, from player champion to um, back to a, a supporter. What was it like um, witnessing um, the Bulldogs? rise again to win a flag in 2016. Were you there and uh, what are your memories? No, well, I've got to be honest and tell you, I've seen one game since I finished. Wow. Yeah, I've watched every game on TV, but I've only ever physically been to one game. And it's strange that you, you it's not strange, but you do ask me about that comparison with Montepelli and Whitney. One of my great mates who was a non-footballer, <clears throat> we went and played at, uh, well, sorry, we went and watched a match out at uh, Arden Street. And, and uh, this mate of mine said, watch this bloke on the wing. He said, I don't like to say this because Witten's a mate of mine. He said, but I think this bloke could be as bloody good as him. I said, who is he? Doug Hawkins. And that's the only game I've ever seen Doug Hawkins play. I think, I think, and I'm getting around it now, I think Bottom Pally, well, he's as good as Witten was and all around as good as Witten was, but in this different era. Before. Before, before uh, to the year 2000, Whitten was the best player that was going around. And I think since about 2010, Bottom Pally's probably the better player ever since. Wow. And, and there are some good players in the, in the AFL now, but um, they're not as rugged and strong uh, as they were in those eras, I don't think. Um, well, Merv, we're coming close to the end of the podcast, and as we end all of our episodes, without a word of warning, I'm going to put you back in the hot seat, okay? Now, we end with a quiz, a bulldog quiz, which we put 60 seconds on the clock. We give you a little bit of power, Merv, okay? we get You, you can choose one of the categories. Um, the categories on offer today are the, is the 1960s, okay? Or you can choose 
Bulldog coaches from 1925 to current. Um, so they're your two categories. Which one would you prefer? Uh, Bulldog coaches. Bulldog coaches. Okay. All right. You're brave. I love it. All right. Here we go. Good luck. Um, Bulldog coaches. Question number one. Con McCarthy was our first Bulldog captain coach in 1925. Was that true or false? False. It was true. Rodney Ede, well, coached, okay. Rodney Ede coached more wins than losses at the Bulldogs. Is that true or false? Did he coach more wins than losses? I missed that bit. Yeah. Did Rodney Ede coach more wins than losses at the Bulldog coach? Is that true oh, or false? True. True, correct. Brendan McCartney coached the highest tally of Bulldog games without ever reaching the finals. Is that true or false? True. True, correct. Who has coached us to most victories in club history? Kelly Sutton. Oh, it was Luke Beveridge. Which coach, oh. took, which coach took over from Alan Joyce's sacking in 1996? Terry. Oh, the black from Hawthorne. Yep. Um, Terry. Oh, can't, can't think of his name. Wallace, it's okay. Um, who is the higher win-loss ratio at the club, Charlie Sutton or Mick Malthouse? Mick Malthouse. Oh, it was Charlie Sutton just. Oh. And right on the siren, we're going to give you the last question. Uh, so don't worry, you've got a last question here. All right, here we go. What is the nickname of the of the 1982 and 83 coach, Ian Hampshire? Bluey. You got it. Oh, God. <laughs> you, could have, you could have asked me more of those. <laughs> um, so we're putting the scores up on the board right now to see where you are on the Lord leaderboard. And there it is. Oh, you've got it. Lovely. Yeah, ended on a high, and that's uh, that's how we like it. Um, uh, that's no doubt about that. Um, now, before we say goodbye today, we um, we'd love to hear your final words. Have you, have you got any messages for for Bulldog supporters um, of how you'd like to be remembered, and and any final words you'd like to say to them? How I'd like to be remembered? No, I, I, I don't know. But so long as they say hello to me if I walk down the main street somewhere, there's not many of them here in Ararat, but. Uh, I just hope that I put in for Footscray Footy Club and use my heart and soul the way I, I played for the amount of games I played and and, and to go through as a, as a mascot of the footy club, to become a coach of the footy club, uh, to become a chairman of selectors of the footy club. Um, yeah, I, I'd say just remember, remember me as somebody who was a, a good bulldog and faithful all the way through. Um, I might have ruffled, well, I did ruffle some feathers every now and then, but uh, that's the way I am in any case. Um And, and the future of the footy club, um, I, I, as I said earlier in the piece, Matt, I think they've got to get better, bigger players, about half a dozen of them, that, that are around about the six-foot mark. I think we've got too many that, that are around about my height, of five foot eight. Um, but that's where I think they're failing at the moment. And, and of course, from the, the premiership in 2016, there's still some players playing now, and they're getting older. So they're going to have to be replaced. Might be in for hard times for a while, I think, Matty. Have you got any hope for us? Is there a, is there a chance that uh, that we can win some, some some silverware? Well, I think so. You might get the lowest amount this this year, but the, the build up's got to come from the end, from the middle of this year to the end, to the start of next year, and then I think things should turn around and give us some more respite and get some better results. I think, Matty. Well, ladies and gentlemen. There's nothing left to say aside from we'd love to thank you from the bottom of our heart, Merv. Um, you know, you're a, a wonderful ambassador and y y your career is, uh, is a storied and amazing one. You're remembered so fondly by every Bulldog supporter that I speak with and we want to thank you. Uh, it's been an honour and a privilege for me today. Well, I thank, I thank you, Matthew, and uh, really, really pleased the way you handled the whole go and uh, you never felt me, you never made me feel embarrassed at any stage. Thank you very much. We'd love to meet you in real life too, mate. We'll have fun, don't you? That's a deal. Ladies and gentlemen, Merv Hobbs. Red in my heart, white in my veins, blue in my diary, white and blue in my veins.